everyone, it's Jessie from Bear Flower Farm with a video that is more oriented towards the business side of flower farming. So for those of you who are new to my channel, my name is Jessie. I am in my second year of flower farming, but I have a marketing background and I used to have a e-commerce side hustle that I built using social media. And one of the questions that I hear a lot is, how do I get more of my customers who buy bouquets from me, they might be fellow flower farmers, to be more engaged. I have X amount of followers, but oftentimes I see my posts only going to a minute percentage of them. So that's what this post or this video is going to be about. Now you might be saying to yourself, why am I talking about this this time of year? My season is winding down. I don't have a lot of pretty photos. And that is exactly why I wanted to talk about this right now, because I think this is a great time of year to level up your social media content, because it's not just about the pretty photos. It's about having substance behind them. And that's what I want to talk about. So I want to talk about, um, like three major things. And most of this is going to be centered around Instagram with some learnings towards Facebook, but we're gonna focus more about Instagram because that's honestly where more of my experience has been. But let's talk about recent trends that the algorithm favors. We're gonna also talk about fundamental truths that I believe will not change for social media. And that's where the meat of this conversation is gonna be. And then we're gonna talk about um, some examples using my own personal feed. And you'll see how some of the fundamental truths and the algorithms that I talk about uh, come to life in those examples. So one thing to note is that I have a Patreon where I talk about some of this stuff in detail weeks ago. So all of that is laid out in blog post form content. If you want access to that type of gated content for the price of a fancy coffee per month, so $5, you can get access to that. One thing that I'm not going to talk about here, but I talk about in detail in my Patreon post is actually how I use email campaigns to also also uh, drive engagement. So helpful if you guys have email addresses and you've run out of topics in terms of what to talk about with your customers. They've gotten really good uh, responses and just engagement from the fellow growers at our co-op. So something to check out. Link is below if you're interested in checking out my Patreon. Uh, but without further ado, let's begin. So Instagram. Uh, I referenced the side hustle company that I had. It's called Bear Soaps, that's actually where the namesake of Bear Flower Farm came from because without Bear Soaps, I would never have gotten into flower farming. But I bear, I built Bear Soaps off of uh, Instagram and Facebook ads. And it, at its height, which was during COVID because everyone shifted e-commerce, it was close to a six-figure company. So post-COVID, it was still grossing high five um, five-figure revenue uh and then recently i kind of wound it down and i'm starting to wind it back up with just shampoo bars but anyway i spent a lot of money on facebook ads in one year alone i spent about twenty nine thousand dollars on facebook and instagram ads so when i say facebook ads i mean it interchangeably with facebook and instagram they're under the company called meta now but the reason why i bring up that that amount that I spent is because when you spend money on ads, you can get a lot of followers. But just because you get new people following your page or your handle on Instagram, it doesn't mean that they're going to be engaged. So uh, once you get those followers, you have the hard job of now keeping them engaged with your content so that when you post, you'll get served or they'll get served your content again. And this is especially important for something like flower farming where I feel like sometimes people are just not ready to purchase as a retail customer. You have to like nurture them a bit more. People purchase flowers for occasions. Sometimes people purchase it weekly for their homes, but I find that more people tend to wait to purchase for a special occasion or maybe they're waiting out on your subscription. So keeping them engaged and making sure they can see that content when you have a sale is really, really important. So let's talk about some of the more recent algorithm trends uh, and how those algorithms might favor one type of format over another. Uh, the preface for this is that in my day job, Meta, as, as well as some other social media companies like TikTok, Pinterest, Google, 
they all came to my job for a media day uh, a few weeks ago. So heard it from the horse's mouth in terms of these algorithm trends. And some of this stuff is not super, uh, I guess, surprising, but some of the stuff was surprising to me. So when Meta came in, they talked about how what they're seeing is 50% of the time spent on Instagram and Facebook is spent watching videos. So not surprising in terms of how popular videos are, but what I thought was surprising was that 80% of the reels that are viewed on Instagram are viewed with sound on. Now, I didn't realize that it defaults to sound on when you go to that reels tab. So um, I think a lot of people are consuming reels through that discover tab or reels tab. So if you're making reels without sound, which I don't think a lot of people are, but you're definitely missing out. But it's not just sound with music. You can do closed captioning. Obviously, if you do any type of verbiage, you should have some sort of sub caps. Uh, those are also really, really good. But I think it was just this impact of sound that is having on Instagram that I was a little bit more surprised to hear. Uh, the other thing with Reels is that 40% of Reels use effects and uh, those who use effects obviously get a higher reach within the stat. So the takeaway here, uh, well, before I get to the takeaway is that one thing that Meta said is that Reels is what they call their discovery engine platform. So what that means is that if you make a Reel and it does well, Meta or Instagram is going to prioritize showing that to people who don't follow you. So you are more likely to be served a Reels from someone who you don't follow because they're using that to basically push people to consume more content. And that's why they want their content creators to create more Reels. And obviously Reels is kind of this like competitor against TikTok. So they're using that mode to try to get people who are on TikTok also onto Instagram or potentially get one away uh, from TikTok onto the Instagram platform. So the takeaway here is that if you're looking to increase your following, you might want to consider making more Reels if you haven't done so yet. Um, and I personally don't make a ton of reels. I do make them here and there, but it is something that I think I will prioritize trying to make a little bit more of, especially as winter tulip season comes about. I find it kind of hard to make reels sometimes, especially out in the field, because if I'm growing something from seed, it takes like a while for it to germinate. And then you put it in the ground and it's going to take a while to grow versus tulips have a much faster turnover time. So naturally it's easier for me to make reels, but um, there are so many other ways or content that you can put onto reels. So you shouldn't limit yourself with just making reels of growing related content. The other thing about reels that I've noticed is that when you have a good reels and it's being served to non-followers and you get new followers, Instagram now notifies you that XYZ followed you from your recent reels, which I thought was a really cool addition because most of the time um, I'm obviously not getting a notification for why a person is starting to follow me. So let's get into some fundamental truths that I personally believe don't change on social media, even in the midst of algorithms changing, because one day it's post stories, the next day it's make more reels, right? Like, but there are still some fundamental truths for social media that don't change. And this is based off of personal experience. And that fundamental truth for me is that there is still a place for posts. And I personally believe that posts plus stories can lead to a more engaged following if you use them correctly. So where I have personally found success is within the posts, making the posts count. And what I mean by that is it can't just be a pretty flower. So we had the advantage uh, as flower farmers to have really pretty pictures to begin with. I mean, flowers kind of do the work in terms of making a picture look good. But the problem is it's not just about having a pretty flower on your post. There should be substance in the words behind that pretty picture. And if you look at my feed, I don't have a lot of pretty picture posts. 
I do post on stories about what's out there and those pretty flowers, but obviously stories will disappear after 24 hours. Uh, I look at my posts as a place for me to talk about something that is either important to me, for me to make an announcement, or for me to have content that is usually informational in some way or another to live on my Instagram page that I want permanently versus on stories where it disappears. So I guess what I'm trying to say is if you save posts for the important stuff, and people interact with it, you are naturally going to have a better chance with your posts reaching more people in the future because the algorithm realizes that your posts have had success before. And every post, you know, kind of operates in its own individual um, environment in the sense that if it's a bad post, it doesn't matter how good your posts were before, it's still not gonna get served. But um, if you have a history of having good posts, it definitely helps the algorithm. So. What can you talk about in your posts, especially this time of year? Talk about yourself. People, whether or not it's a fellow grower or retail customer, they love getting to know about you. Talk about how you got into flower farming. Talk about your side or your day job. Is flower farming something that's a side hustle? Why do you do it as a side hustle, right? Like anything that you're willing to share about yourself, people typically like getting to know someone else. That's why relationship building is so important, right? So we don't often have the ability to do this face-to-face. -face. You can start the process by doing it through a post. Um, tell them about your journey. Tell them about like, hey, right now, it's all about fall cleanup so that I can get ready for the spring. What does that look like? It means ripping everything out. It means I'm transplanting stuff right now that is going to bloom in about six months for the spring. This is the lead time on those early spring flowers. That's why you're able to get local spring flowers. Stuff like that, believe it or not, is really interesting for that end consumer who is buying your bouquet and it helps them make or it helps them appreciate your flowers more, especially if you're doing something like a subscription. Talk about both your successes, but also failures. Again, stuff that you don't think would resonate with a an retail buyer totally resonates. Some of my best posts were about my thrip situation, were about having weeds out in the yard. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, my field is a relatively small growing space, but I have a full-time job. It was unmanageable for me. And a lot of other people are in that exact same situation. There are very few places where no one has any weeds on their property and people feel almost like guilty for having weeds because they don't see other people having weeds, right? So be vulnerable, talk about your failures, and you're going to find a lot more connection and engagement with those kind of posts. Um, and then last but not least, I touched upon, upon this, but make them informative so that the follower can learn uh, can learn something. And I think this is where I went wrong in the beginning. So I always view, and I still view this, uh, that Facebook is kind of more for your local community, people who are buying. Instagram has more of a national following, usually fellow flower farmers follow each other, and you're not going to get follower or customers off of Instagram. That is false. I have quite a bit of retail customers who follow me on Instagram, but I was trying to segregate them to go, Hey, like go to Facebook if you're a retail customer and then go to Instagram if you're a fellow grower. And I mean, I don't use Facebook that much. I use Instagram a lot more. I cross post onto Facebook from Instagram, but a lot of my retail customers are just on Instagram. So I found that they were following me on Instagram, even though I was posting grower related content and they were still engaging, very interested in that kind of content. So what I'm trying to say here is that content that you don't think people would be interested on, if it's informative, if it's educational, even if it's just a place for you to kind of like journal a learning, it could really have potential. So this is a place for you to experiment. If you've just been posting like really pretty photos, like here's a really pretty Dahlia, the name is XYZ and I love it. And that's the end of it. Talk a little bit more about it. Talk about, hey, like this was a Dahlia that I sourced from XYZ. It took me this amount of months to grow. It had pest pressure on it, but now in the cool weather, it's finally looking beautiful and we can't wait to use these in bouquets. Like the difference between that post with a little bit more content versus the other is really, really huge. So that brings me to the second fundamental truth, which is that long form content is not dead. I'm going to repeat that. Long form content on social media is not 
dead. And this is going to run contrary to a lot of the advice that you see on social media, which is keep it bite sized, keep it digestible. Uh, you know, the average time on social media, people are just scrolling through. I find that to be false if your following is engaged and wanting to interact with your content. My average post is a few hundred words long. I mean, if you go through my feed, you'll see like I often end up getting to the max of the post. And I find that when I talk about a topic that is relevant for other people, people will read all of it, of course, right? Um, and that is how I really built an engaged following on Bear Soaps. I view my social media platform as exactly that, a platform. And it is in some ways a soapbox platform for me. So if you've been following long enough, you'll know that sustainability is something that is important to me. I use my Bear Soaps account as a platform to educate my customers on sustainability topics. And it wasn't just like go plastic free, blah, blah. I talked a lot about just like, um, you know, like insects outside. I talked about um, like what does good packaging look like for a small business beyond just not using plastics, like the responsibility of a small business to make it easier for the consumer to recycle whatever they get and what does that look like. So I brought that long form content into Bear Flower Farm and I'm going to go over my specific posts to show you exactly what I'm talking about. But Really what I do is I use my posts, as I said before, for that long form content and to have a permanent place for information that I think people would want to see uh, just you know, on my page that doesn't disappear. And I use stories for the more day to day educational pieces. Now, sometimes on stories, there are things that I'm like, man, I wish this would live a little bit longer, but uh, I've now gotten to the point where I feel I have a lot of engagement on my stories. It's all, it's getting fed to, uh, a much wider group of my following than usually my posts. And so both complement each other, but they're just different in terms of how much time I spend on them, as well as just the ease of being able to post a story. You, you take a snapshot, you write a few words, and then you post it and it's super easy. All right, let's get to the good stuff, the tangible stuff. So I'm gonna talk about my posts and numbers behind them, but I wanna preface this by saying, I don't have a big Instagram following. I have just under 2000 people. And I've always said, it's not about the number of followers, it's about the quality of followers. There is actually a video that I did earlier in the year talking about three business concepts that are really important for everyone in whatever industry you're in to learn about. And one of them is about the thousand uh, true fans rule. So I'm going to post the video above here, but also in the link below if you're interested. And the gist of it is you really need a thousand true fans or followers who are truly engaged, who buy from you regularly, who are the big spenders for your business to be successful. Because what's the point of having a million followers or customers if they only buy from you once, if they don't click on your content or don't engage with you at all, right? Like, like they're, they're just a number at that point. So it's quality over quantity as people have always said. So now the question is, how do you get to that quality piece, right? So we're gonna look at my five most recent posts. Um, and then we're gonna talk about the numbers and my intention and what I got out of this post. So the first one is a post about lilies that appeared at a locally run uh, sustainable forestry workshop event. Um, and even though this was locally run, people uh, flew in, there was quite a bit of attendance. Uh, I think a couple of the presenters were from the Sustainable Floor Street Network. So this, like we're talking about designers that are pretty well known. And I talked about how I had my lilies there, um, but it was a full circle moment because one of the attendees happened to be a lily workshop in our behind the scenes instructor type of person. So I saw her there, I was like, oh, like, you're at this workshop, my lilies are there. So she actually took some photos for me and that's the photos that I used in this post. But that post got 73 likes. So this is lower than what I would normally get uh, for a good post. And then it was served to just 580 people. So I only had one save and one send. However, there was an intention behind this post and I've talked about this at length in my other YouTube videos. I've had a hard time moving my lilies with florists. No problem with retail, but with florists. And I want to 
shift more of my sales towards the wholesale floristry route. So I often share other people using my lilies, designs from people not using my lilies just to give these florists or designers inspiration. So I posted this because this was a social proof post showing that someone with this designer's stature uh, bought lilies and you know had them at the workshop. So again, a social proof type of post that I wasn't necessarily looking for in the form of an ROI in terms of social media shares. The second post here is a reels and it is a reels that is not very sexy in nature. It is about what sustainable packaging looks like. So I am selling quorums for those of you who don't know, they're still on sale. Uh, but when I had launched my sale, I got a lot of orders and before those orders came in, I thought very deeply about what does the packaging look like? Because there is nothing worse to me than receiving a large box with a very, very small item in that box and having all that dead space because all that dead space has an extra carbon footprint. Think about all the other boxes that plane or that truck could have fit if someone just picked the right size box. So picking the right size box is very important for me. I talk about how that contributes to a package's carbon footprint. I talk about how all my labels are recyclable so that once you take the forms out, really the entire thing can be chucked into the recycling bin and how I think that that is the business's responsibility to make sure that they are doing right by the customer to make it convenient to recycle. So that Reels had 70 likes, but served to 1,248 people. So similar as the Lily post, but served to more than two times the amount of people because it was a Reels. I had 13 total comments, including my own, one sent, three saves. And, you know, this was one of those soapbox type of platforms where a lot of people following me may not have thought about this. And I think it's just one of those topics that is important to get out there. And I know that if I posted this on Bear Soaps where more of my following is sustainably oriented, it definitely would have gotten a lot more shares, saves, that kind of stuff. But that's totally okay. This is content that I'm passionate about and I want to put out there. Third post was about LA hybrids. So I've been growing a lot of lilies, started first with OT hybrids. Now the LA hybrids are coming in. And I wanted to do an update on just the secession that was coming in, how many I planted as a whole, some high level learning. So this is content that complements my YouTube content as well as my day-to-day -day stories. And it was content that I wanted to live in a specific place. So I would say that this was a pretty good post for me. It was 154 likes reaching 920 accounts, nine comments, including my own, three cents, three saves. And the comments here ran the gist of, wow, like, I need to grow lilies, or I didn't know there were non-fragrant lilies. So educational post here and got a bit of, I would say above average engagement here. Next post is a reels. So this one was about hydroponic tulips. So using footage that I had from last winter season and talking about how excited I am for winter tulips because I had just come in from two hours of weeding outside. There is no weeding involved with hydroponic tulips. Um, and then I also talked about how I have a CSA subscription. So that piece was tailored for my local um, customers and then what it means to grow about 10,000 tulips for me on my scale. I mean, we're talking about 50 times the amount of other stuff. So I want to, like, this was informational on all fronts for everyone. Um, and this one did really well. This one reached 1,674 people, 116 likes, nine comments, including my own, four cents, six saves, six new followers, which was pretty cool because that uh, comes up in the analytics for me. And then um, I got more CSA sales from this. And then I also just as a whole, I think, engaged more of my customers who are getting the CSA subscription to have a little bit more behind the scenes view. And for those people who signed up for my CSA, I have their email addresses. All of it was done online. I will be shooting them emails throughout the season so that they can get a bit of the behind the scenes because ultimately a CSA in its true spirit is a share in your farm. It's a share in the investment that you put up. And I think that that share also should bring them behind the scenes of what you're doing to make those blooms come to life. Um, and then the last post that I want to talk about. So the fifth 
post was a focus only bouquet photo. I'm, I'm always the first to admit, I am not a great bouquet maker. I'm not a designer. Designing bouquets is my weakest piece. I've actually taken some like online bouquet courses, but it's just, it's not my strong suit and it's something that I definitely need to work on. I just haven't had as much time this year to dedicate, but I put a photo of it on because the, the focus was not about the bouquet itself. The focus was about the unexpected amount of focals that I ended up getting in August that I did not expect to the point where I actually ended my summer CSA in July because I was expecting a dead August. Instead, I got rose lilies, I got lisianthus, I got dahlias. I expected a dahlias, but I didn't expect it with the lisianthus. So this was kind of like a success story post, um, and it got 127 likes, reaching 749 people, three comments, including my own, one send, three saves. More importantly, it got three a la carte orders. So I was not anticipating any a la carte orders but um people really loved how many focals were in there and so it was it was a good roi post from that perspective even though the numbers were they were fine but they weren't like out of the ballpark great so i only covered five posts you get the gist and again, I have just under 2,000 followers, so I don't have a big following by any means. And what you start seeing is the bigger your following, the harder it is obviously to keep everyone engaged. So it's actually easier to build a more engaged small following um, with fewer people than it is with larger uh, amounts of people. So what you start, what, what you see is the sweet spot is you want to get like above 10,000 to maybe like 50,000. Once you get into the six figure range of following, like with influencers, um, they don't always have the most engaged following. So whenever we work with influencers at work, we actually like what we call micro influencers. So people with the 10 to 50,000 follower range, because even though they have fewer people, uh, if they post something, more people are going to see and engage with it than someone with like 500,000 people. Because it sounds like they have a lot of followers, but when they post something, it doesn't get served to everyone. And even when it does get served to that person um, who's following them, they may not be engaged, right? So again, quality over quantity. So I hope this video was helpful for you. I hope it encourages you to go a little bit beyond your comfort zone in terms of what you're willing to put out there, especially when it comes to failures and vulnerable topics. Those are the topics that people really want to hear about because that's what resonates a lot. And of course, celebrate your successes, but any account that only has successes, I think isn't telling the full truth. And this is what people crave for today. They crave for authenticity and they crave the whole picture. So we live in a world where I think everyone is always go, 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 trying to get higher sales, trying to just do more, more, more. And although it might look like that I'm doing a lot, I am very intentional about where I spend my time, where I don't want to spend my time at all, and really learning from my mistakes. And I think that when I put out there my failures and what I do with those failures to learn from them, it really helps everyone else. And you also have the ability to do that too with your social media. You may not think it resonates or is relevant for your customers, but it probably is. So let me know in the comments below if you have any questions, what has helped you with your social media following and engaging them, especially on Instagram. And I will see you in the next video.